We are in Romans chapter 10, finishing up. It's encouraging to hear some people come up after last week and say how much that illustration with Dr. Um, Dr. Law and Dr. Grace helped understand the gospel. AJ too? Good. All week. Great. Praise God. It's a good chapter. And so we made it through verse uh, 13, and we'll start at 14 today and read to the end of the chapter, but I think I'll just read it as we go along here. But I, I want to start out with a little in- illustration and uh, good news, and that is uh, you've just inherited $10 million. <clears throat> Isn't that great news? You've just inherited $10 million from a distant relative that maybe you didn't even know you had. So all of a sudden you find yourself in church today hearing that you've inherited $10 million. That's good news, isn't it? All right, sorry. I mean, you've seen it maybe on TV, the people jumping for joy when they win some money and and getting all excited or at work even. But uh, the bad news is that nobody told you that. (laughs) I mean, what if you've all your life inherited $10 million and nobody's ever told you yet? It doesn't affect your life at all, does it? it? Your life continues on as if you never, because you never knew. And so it continues on and on. And so this passage that we look at today, the beginning of it, is kind of like that. And I'll begin, I'm going to start with just verse 13, just so we can remember what we talked about last week. It says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me back up again to verse, uh, one more verse to 12. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Aren't you glad, irrespective of your race here this morning, that if you've called on God, he's been rich towards you? He's lavished his grace on you? The Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Encouraging words. And then it goes on to say, all right, let's see how this works. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, and quoting from an Old Testament passage, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So how are they going to hear? How how are they going to call? He says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is going to be saved. But how are they going to call on him who they haven't believed? And how are they going to believe in him who they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? See, it's kind of a backwards order here, but he asks good questions. Every single one of those is a good question. And really, if you look at it uh, the opposite way around and what he's written here, a messengers have to be sent. Number two, the messengers that are sent have to proclaim or declare the word of God. Third thing is the sinners hear the word of God. Fourth thing, sinners believe the word of God. Fifth thing, is that sinners call on Christ on the name of God. And then the sixth resulting in and are saved. You see what he's saying? Kind of said it in a backwards way, but that's what he's leading to. So then, and he states in verse 17, so then faith comes, how? By hearing. And hearing by lots of good stories, by philosophy, by getting together and trying to figure out how the world should be straightened out. No, it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's how faith comes. Not through philosophy, not like through a lot of things that people might think. And the reason you believe today in Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, the reason you believe is because somebody told you. You actually one day heard the word of God. If your kids are young, you've probably heard it from your parents. And it's a privilege to hear it at a young age. And so the reason you believe today is because you heard a message. You heard the word of Christ. And you believed 
and you called on the name of the Lord and he saved you. And so that's kind of what happens here. But he asks the question, how are they going to hear without a preacher? That means a herald. Somebody, it doesn't mean just from, I know God chose the, the, through the foolishness of preaching, the Bible says, to save those that are lost. It's a foolish thing, but what it is, it means a herald. It doesn't mean just from the pulpit that you preach. It's a, somebody who declares, somebody who, a herald in the olden days, we didn't have, they didn't have internet. They didn't have, how do they get the word out? The king gets together, he makes a decree, and he calls all his, his messengers or his heralds out. And he says, hey, I want you to tell this to the people. And they go into the town, they yell it from the top of their lungs so that everybody can hear it, and then they post it for those who can read it. And that's how a message would be sent in those days. And that's what he's saying to us too. We are heralds of the gospel. Every one of us who's been born again, really, is a herald of good news. And what a privilege it is, isn't it? As you can walk into, I've seen this or, and on the internet too, people go to share the gospel. Here you knock at somebody's house and say, do you know Jesus? At least they got a concept of who he is. You know what happens when they do it on the door in India, in a village, and I saw it happen? Knock on somebody's door and he says, do you know Jesus? And they say, hmm, let me see, no, never heard of him. Maybe ask my neighbor, maybe he knows where he lives. You know, as though you're looking for, for this guy named Jesus, and they have no concept of who he is and what his name is. So how are they going to hear without a preacher? And God has chosen mankind to share the gospel. These were blessed to be a part of this, an honor to herald the good news. And Jesus told his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And so we're all really sent to declare this message. Um, Paul, at the beginning of this chapter, said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. His desire and heart, heart cry for his own people was that they'd be saved. But he knew that wasn't enough. Just a desire is great. And even the prayer is even better. But that alone isn't going to save anybody. We could lock ourselves in this building and pray until we're old and gray and never leave it to tell anybody about Jesus. And then it's kind of defeated its purpose. It all goes together. God's given you a desire. He's put it within your heart. You pray for them. And then you go out and try to win them. You, you share the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. You know, it didn't say simply by praying. I think that's a part of it. You pray for people. But uh, faith comes by hearing. As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good news. And that's the kind of news I want to hear. Glad tidings of great joy, like at Christmas time. But how beautiful are the feet. I think Dave talked about those last time in his message. <laughs> Uh, it's really wise to say the feet because really when you look at it, somebody has said too, it's one of the ugliest parts of your body. <laughs> Toes, they go all crooked. and The older you get, the uglier they get. I think, I don't know. But how beautiful are the feet of those who preach? Why the feet? And, and, and the example of this is, is somebody, Israel is in exile. They're in Babylon. They're away from their country. Somebody, maybe a herald comes from their country and the king is allowing their exiles to go back to their homeland. And so these heralds come and say, hey, listen, listen, we're going to be restored to our country. We're going to be leave the exile, leave our our refugee status right now. We're going to leave that and go to the homeland. And boy, when you get that news, if you've been longing to return to your homeland to get homesick and you're heard that, you just love that herald for telling you it. Thank him up and down. And, and you. you uh the feet that have crossed maybe thousands of, or hundreds of miles off a treacherous land just to, just to tell you this news. And so you can turn around at least to the person who thinks it's good news and knows it's good news. It's, they appreciate the person who told them. I remember a guy in Macedonia named Boshko. And we got, it was one of our last nights there and all the Christians got together in the house and they just came visit us. Some left, you know, you eat together, you eat. There was a whole evening and night together. And I was saying goodbye to one guy and, and I went outside and he says, he says, it just astonishes me that God would send somebody all the way from America just so that I could hear about Christ and believe in him. So what he's saying is how beautiful are the feet. The feet speak of action, speaks of, of going places. And I remember I've told you about Yovo Yekic too. He was a 
Croatian man, and we went to visit him during the war, and I was too dumb kind of to understand the bombings that already started. They kind of had a time of peace, but I crossed the border into Croatia, and, and we were getting in all kinds of stop every 10 minutes or so, searched the car, all kinds of stuff. But we finally came to this house of a guy, a preacher that we heard of, me and another missionary. And he greets us at the door, and he's 100 years old. He could still walk, and he got to the door, opened it for us. And his first thing is he just he just begins to weep. And, I, and he said, why, too? He says, oh, he says, if I only had your legs. I was about 20, 20 some, just young 20s anyway. When he looks at me and, and the missionary with me, he looks and weeps and says, if I only had your legs, I could go one more time and share the gospel in the villages around. And he'd been used mightily of God. He came to the United States and and worked for the Henry Ford Company back in, I think it was 1912. Was here in the United States making a good money compared to what back home. But God called him, saved him here in the States at some meeting where he got to wear some, hear it in his own language. He went back to his country and became a missionary and shared the gospel and saw revival in Croatia. And God started many churches. God used him. But even at the end of his life, he's still praying to God that he, if I only had your legs, I could go one more time. And so how beautiful. Why? Because why? So that he can tell somebody about you, but in hopes that these people will hear and believe that in heaven there will be another soul saved. And so then verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And hey, Chris, Keish, do you ever feel like that? Lord, who has ever believed our report? <laughs> you tell the gospel with people over and over. Have you had that experience, a little bit of frustration? Lord, who's believed us? I, God, I'm doing what you told me to do, but my goodness, how few believe. And Isaiah kind of seems to say the same thing. He says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. So the gospel is something that has to be obeyed. There's a response that has to happen. When you share the gospel with somebody and tell them about Christ and his birth, death, resurrection, coming to life, coming to uh, forgive our sins and to give us new life. And you tell them all of those things and then you tell them to what Jesus told us, repent and believe. Repent and believe. And you get to that part and you find out that not, Paul says here, not all have obeyed the gospel. It's something to be obeyed. And then the example he gives is Isaiah himself. He says, Lord, what Isaiah cried out to God and said, Lord, who's believed our report? Who's believed our gospel? Who's believed the story we told them? It's good news, but it's not believed. The publisher's uh, clearinghouse sweepstakes, you've seen those on TV when they go to somebody's house and say, you just won $5 million. And, and the people at the door just, you know, they have a camera there and they're hopping up and down, just can't believe it, you know. And it's changed their life. They're, they're crying one minute, just in delirious happiness, and they don't know what to do, cry or laugh or what, and some of them. And they just can't believe this, but uh, that they've won the sweepstakes, you know. And, and they believe it. In the end, they, they, they believe it because they're going to get this money and they hand them a check and they, whoa. I can't believe this. You go to somebody else's house. Imagine this scene. You go to somebody else's house and say, hey, we've got good news for you. You've just won the sweepstakes. You've just won $5 million. And the guy goes behind him and grabs a, a gun and says, hey, get out of here. You're on my property. I want you off my property. Hey, but we got good news for you, man. You just want get off my property. This sounds a little bit like sometimes when you're sharing the gospel. <laughs> We have good news for people. Some accept it and they're joyful, excited about it. Others simply either refuse to believe. And we'll find that here happening in our story too. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Lord, who's believed our report? They haven't believed or obeyed. And I remember Tony Barbuto, he was a missionary or pastor in Mexico, eh, Mexico. Let me get my country, Macedonia. But he's told me this. He said, Dan, when I got out of Bible school and you guys left, he said, I thought I was coming back just through me. He said, I was going to preach one sermon and 3,000 souls were going to get saved. Just like in Acts chapter. 
So I, I went out, Dan, in my experience in these years that I've been preaching, it's through me till I found I have to preach about 3,000 service for one sermons for one soul to get saved. <laughs> Again, it, uh, Lord, who has believed our report? Who has believed? Ah. Uh, and you know, and you're newly excited. I've heard this from some of you that are sitting here too, that when you got saved, you were so excited. You thought it was the greatest news in the world. And then you thought when you went to your relatives and you were going to tell them that they were going to be just as excited as you were. And you tried and you did. Some of you told me it said it didn't go over so well. They didn't even think it was very good news. <laughs> they didn't like what you had to say. And you're just in shock. Oh, what? How can you not like this? And then it makes that statement again in verse 17 that we've referred to. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Remember, we're talking about Israel in chapters 9, 10 and 11, especially. And he says this, have they not heard? But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound, he quotes Psalm 19, verse 4. He quotes this and says, for their sound has gone out. To all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. So faith comes by hearing. And you say of Israel, well, well maybe, maybe they didn't hear. If faith comes by hearing, maybe they didn't hear then. And the writer here says, no, no. Have they not heard, he asks? And he talks about the general revelation of this song, uh, song 19, where it talks about the heavens declare the glory of God. Firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day they utter speech. Night unto night shows forth knowledge. And he says, in the same way, they've heard, they've had general, and then the rest of the chapter goes on to talk about more specific revelation. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul and so on. But you say, ask, have they not heard? And you come away concluding, well, if they've heard, then why don't they believe? Why haven't the Jews believed? Well, you can't. what he's saying here is you cannot believe, blame it on your not hearing it. If you're a Jew, he says, you can't say, I never heard, for you have heard. The message has been declared. And, and it's interesting, if you follow the book of Acts, everywhere Paul went, he first seemed to go to the synagogue. Wherever a gathering of Jews might be, he shared the gospel. They've heard. They've heard, he says. And then he asks the second question, did they not know or did they not understand? And he uses a verse that's kind of strange to us. Uh, it says, I will provoke you to jealousy. Here's a quote. From those who are not a nation, I will move you to anger with a foolish nation. I'm speaking of the Gentiles here. And, and actually, the quote goes like this in Deuteronomy, if you want to read all of it. It goes this, Jesus, God is speaking. He says, they have provoked me to jealousy by uh, what is not God. That's in Deuteronomy 32, 21. They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. And God turns the total thing around and says, but I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. You are not my people, he said about the Gentiles early in chapter 9. And I will move you to anger by a foolish nation, by a nation that doesn't understand. He seems to be saying three things. They prided themselves in their nationality. They prided themselves in being a Jew. We are the seed of Abraham. And then their second thing is we have the law. We have it. We have this. We have that. And yet they missed it. And he said, even, even they knew it's written. It was foretold. It was foretold in their scriptures that God would make them jealous by a nation that's not a nation. And it was happening before their eyes. And this was happening. And you ask, did they not hear? Yes. Didn't they know this? Yes, that was foretold to them. They knew this. But then why are they still in unbelief? And then he kind of settles it with two, two things at the end. In verse 20 here, he says, and Isaiah is very bold to say, it's a bold statement here what he makes. I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. Speaking of Gentiles, we didn't have the law back then. 
and all the privileges that the Jews had. But God says, I will be found by those who weren't even looking for me. I think that's Laureate's testimony. I wasn't looking for God. He just one day showed up and I heard the gospel and man, I wanted it. Privilege. Somebody else can sit there all their life, have a Bible, grow up in the church and not believe it. Be seeking God, but seeking like the Jews, in, in, in their ignorance, he says, they were seeking to establish their own righteousness. I'm going to do it my way. Frank Sinatra's song, I'll do it my way. I think it was uh, uh, Robbie Zacharias that said they're still singing that song in hell. I did it my way, and that's why they're there. But it's doing it his way. The Gentiles find him in salvation, and the Jews become jealous. He stirs them to jealousy by that. It's a dramatic image of grace, isn't it? We weren't even seeking. God just displays himself to us, to the people, and they believe. Um, grace. Somebody titled it this way. So you can remember kind of an acronym for grace. It goes, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And what a display of that. And then the last verse we have here in our chapter. But to Israel, he says, all day long have I stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. See the difference between verse 20 and verse 21. Man, there weren't even people looking for me that found me. I manifested myself to them. They believed. But to Israel, it's all day long, I've held out my arms to them. All day long. And I've held it out to a disobedient and a contrary or gainsaying people, obstinate people. What he's saying through all of this, it isn't because they didn't hear the gospel. It is not because they didn't understand the scriptures and some of it there. He says the thing is, is that they didn't want to come. They refused to come. I held out my hands all day long. See the mercy of God in this? Even in an obstinate, disobedient, and contrary people, God's still holding on his hand. He called once. No answer. Obstinate disobedience. Continue. The gospel comes again. God's still holding his hand out. Come. Come. To me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. In the flesh, he comes and he comes to the city of Jerusalem. He says that. Come to me. They refuse. You know, after a while, I hold in your hands out to the kids. I do this to the grandkids. Come, come to, come to grandpa. Come to grandpa. You know, after a while, if they kind of seem to come, I don't still hold my hands up. Number one, I get tired. I guess they don't want to come. I give up. Aren't you glad we are? our God is not like that? All day long, I've held up my hand. Just show you the heart of God, doesn't it? The heart of God for people. So we can't have an excuse. It's just like chapter one of, Gen of Romans one. So then everybody, nobody has an excuse. All are without excuse before God. Israel was simply stubborn. Ignorant of God's righteousness, as we read in the beginning of chapter 10. But now we can see that it's a, it's a willing ignorance. In trying to establish their own righteousness in name. And because they stumbled over the stumbling block. It wasn't that Christ wasn't presented to them. It was Christ was presented to them. But they stumbled over him. They didn't want a Savior like that. They wanted one who would do what they wanted him to do. And they stumbled over Christ. And Israel had God's laws. They had the covenants. Remember how they read that in chapter 9? They had everything. His presence, visible presence. All the advantages you could have. And yet they were disobedient and contrary. And this is just kind of a warning to me who grew up in the Christian home too. You can know all of these things and they are advantages. But if you don't take advantage, if, if you don't, good news is good news when you hear it and act on it. And it becomes a part of your life. And so that's, I think, the danger too of growing up in a, we know the, the lingo. But have we experienced the forgiveness of our sins? Have we experienced Christ in reality? Make sure that happens, young people. That you understand those things for yourself and repent on your own. And so in, great, in spite of, of her disobedience, 
God continually, graciously continues to outstretch his hands all day long, pleading for them to return. In Luke chapter 13 and 34, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets. Remember, I sent Isaiah to you. I sent Isaiah. I sent other prophets to you. What did you do with those? He says, the one who kills the prophets. Jerusalem, you're, you're known. Dude. I sent you prophets. What did you do with them? You killed them. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He starts out with, oh, and I can just, can you hear the heart of God? And as Jesus would say, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Was Stephen not sent to her? Was Stephen not sent with the good news that Paul was listening to, the writer of this, and still went ahead with a stoning? They stoned the ones who were sent to him. But Jesus is, he really continues, you stoned the prophets, you, you killed them, he says, but... Uh, how often I wanted to gather your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. It's a beautiful sight. We grew up with chickens and see the hen protect them when trouble comes and open her wings and they all flock under. Beautiful sight, protecting them. Jesus said, God in the flesh said this, how often I desire. You want to know what the heart of God is? Does desire to gather you in, to gather your chicks in. He said, he looked at that one city and he said, oh, you killed the prophet. How often I wanted to gather, but he said, you were not willing. It isn't that you haven't heard. It's not that you don't understand. It's you just don't want to come. He didn't say you couldn't come. He said, you will not come. But you might have life. And so what was our response at the end of this to make it practical? We're talking about Jews in general. But it's talking about people too. How many times have you heard the gospel and not responded? And there's coming a time when God stops calling it and a wake up call. It. Patty had a, a good friend of hers at work. Just do CPR at him at work and not make it this week. We never know, do we? Never know when our time is up. And boy, why not get right with God now? He says we have the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. We make peace with God now. He says it's glad tidings of great joy. And again, it's for all the people. So what about you? Have you heard the gospel? Have you understood it? And if you don't respond or are obstinate to it, then you're basically telling God, no, I will not respond to you. In mercy, he still holds his hands out. And the good news is he says in verse 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe you're saved, but maybe God is talking to you this morning. How are, they, how are your friends going to hear? How are your relatives going to hear? Unless you tell them. Salvation isn't difficult, he said in the beginning of this 10th chapter. It's not like you have to go on some pilgrimage and, or go to heaven and bring Christ down. That's already happened. You don't have to go to the abyss and bring him up. He's already risen from the dead. You don't have to do anything difficult. Salvation is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. If you've been here long enough, it's, it's there. It's on the tip of your tongue. It's in your heart. You have to respond to Christ. Not difficult. Call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I remember a guy in, in the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, or church there. What's his name? Jim Cimbalon's church. Uh, there was a guy there. Uh, I remember hearing this testimony. I was at a conference. They showed it on the screen. He was a hairdresser. For famous people, I think he made over, uh, I think a grand for each head that he did. and his, So he was making tons of money a week. I mean, like 10, 10 or more grand a week, 20 grand a week. He said life was good. He was all with the help. But then something happened in his life. I remember somebody died or just got upset, left the business and ended up on the streets. Beggar. Begging on the streets. Getting into drugs. He got into drugs. And uh, begging for people. Then he met somebody from a hairdresser from the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir Church. And they, the, the man comes and, he, and he, she, she tries to help him. And he, he found out that she's a Christian. And she'd say, uh, he'd ask, well, can I have 20 bucks? Hey, I need 20. 20 bucks was enough to get a fix back then. And all he wanted to do was get drugs. And she didn't know all the story, but she would say, well, here, come to our church. And when you're at church, I'll give it to you. I'll give you the 20. 
So he'd come to church and she'd give him the 20 and she'd just say, remember, call on the name of the Lord. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he goes out to living in the streets again and, and he overdosed one time on heroin and they're hauling him in and he thought this was it. This was it. And he thought he was going to die. But even in that state, God spoke to him. And he remembered those simple words. Call upon the name of the Lord. And as he was on that hospital bed, he called on the name of the Lord. He said, God, save me. You, you rescued him. You rescued him. Saved him from that life he was in. They cleaned him up, bought him clothes after he got out. Changed man. And then they show him singing in the choir. Yes, he didn't have the greatest voice, but he had a heart. It's that simple. And so if you have an obstinate heart, pray. God soften it. Respond to Christ. But it comes by faith. Without faith, without trust in God and what he says, uh, you cannot please him. First John 5.10 says, He who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. He who does not believe in God has made him a liar. Has made God a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. So unbelief is really the slander against the character of God. Says, God, I don't believe you. You're a liar. What you say isn't true. And unbelief, wasn't it unbelief? We went about Adam and Eve today in Sunday school in our class. It was unbelief that led Adam and Eve to sin in the Garden of Eden. It was unbelief that locked the doors of the promised land, was it not? For 40 years, unbelief. Unbelief is what sends us to hell. John 3.18 says this. He who believes in him is not condemned. Goodness. But the opposite side of the coin is, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Why are people condemned? Because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The amazing thing with unbelief too is that Jesus of Nazareth himself, the sovereign God, limited himself. He says he couldn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. I believe God wanted to do many things, don't you? The heart of God. And that's why back in verse 11 of the 10th chapter, it says, whoever believes on him, whoever believes on him shall not be put to shame. See, the object of our faith, the object of my trust is almighty God. It's that simple. Do I trust him or don't I? The object is not faith. We've been talking a lot about faith. The object of our faith is not to have faith in faith, right? Does that make sense? That's positive thinking. Like the kid who came home from school one day, his dad, dad said, how'd you do on your test today? Well, dad, I flunked my math test. I think I flunked my math test. You could be a little more positive than that, couldn't you? He says, well, I'm positive I passed my, flunked my test. <laughs> but putting faith in faith doesn't do anything. It, it's not, you know this, it's not faith that moves mountains, is it? It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God moves mountains. The part that we talked about that faith says first he said in, in Mark's gospel said have faith in God. Have faith in God. And then he talks about the mountains. But your faith in God. God moves mountains. He's the one who's powerful. All powerful. So our faith is in him. And then Hebrews 12 just says, simply says this. Looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. Where are our eyes? Where are your eyes today? Are you looking to him? That means, that means if you are, you're trusting him. Moment by moment, difficulties are going to come. Where do you look? Do you look to the bottom? Do you look to drugs? What do you look to? The thing that you should turn to is God, the author and the finisher of your faith. He's the object again of our faith. <laughs> And so, in closing, you can either say no to God. He's holding out his hand saying, come, come to me. You can tell him no. Or you can say, as this says up here, what the Soteris gave us. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord.
I've never regretted it. I don't think I've met a Christian yet who's ever regretted giving his life to Christ. So what's your response to the greatest news in the world? Free pardon of sins. Oh, amazing. But maybe you've heard the other part. How are they going to hear without a preacher? Maybe God is sending you to one of your neighbors to share the gospel with them. Maybe to a relative. Maybe to another town. Maybe to another country. To tell somebody the good news, the gospel of peace. And he's asking you to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words that we read out of your word. We know on judgment day, Lord, nobody will be have any excuse. We're responsible for our own destruction. Put within us a heart, Lord, to love you, to serve you, to follow you. Thank you, Lord. Today, I thank you that my mom and my dad shared the gospel with me as a little boy. Lord, today, as we face Thanksgiving, I'm thankful for that. I am so thankful that they told me the truth. The truth about heaven, the truth about hell, the truth about Jesus. And I'm so glad. And I'm Lord, we, we praise you for uh, in this room. I don't know how many people it would be that have told, shared the gospel with different ones of us. In church, if somebody has shared the gospel with you, could maybe this Thanksgiving give them a call, thank them for sharing the good news with you. And ultimately, Father, we thank you. We thank you for saving our souls as a kid sang today. Thank you, Lord for making me whole. And Lord, help us to take this good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it may cost us, it may cost us our life. But oh, what a privilege it is to take good news when there's a response. Lord, there will be a response. And we thank you for that. Give us courage, Lord, to continue to proclaim it. And we thank you that there are some that will believe and it will turn. We praise you, Lord, for in this room are many that have turned. And we praise you for that. So today, Lord, in this time of thanksgiving, we, we thank you, Lord, for it. We just pray that you keep everybody safe on the roads as they travel. And uh, just want to bless you, Lord, for this day. And uh, just be with each one as we go out from here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.